Acts chapter 21. Acts 21, this is at page 930 in your pew Bible if that helps you. As we are uh, returning to worship after months away from the Lord's house, uh, we may be a bit self-conscious, we are, about uh, what we are doing. As we look around us and we talk to other Christians uh, who are also getting back to uh, worship, we hear things uh, like this. Yeah, we're back, but it's just not the same without the praise band. I uh, know of one church in particular who says that they will be returning to worship, but because they want to follow every jot and tittle of the CDC's uh, latest deliverances, their worship will be unplugged. And uh, all of a sudden we're reminded that um, the way we worship at Christ Presbyterian Church is, well, uh, different, really uh, different for many churches around you. Uh, I don't know how we would go about plugging in our worship uh, to begin with, let alone how to uh, unplug it. And uh, yes, we recognize that other Christians might even find our worship services to be uh, strange and uh, maybe even quite dull compared to other churches. So uh, as we return to worship, we do well to ask ourselves uh, why we worship the way we do. What are the convictions that govern our worship and cause it to take it the shape that it does? So we're going to continue our break from Matthew a little bit longer and uh, consider what are these convictions that govern our worship as we uh, resume our in-person services. Um, continue that break, I say, that we started back on Ascension Sunday to give further attention to this matter of worship. Last week, we were reminded that uh, it is, after all, corporate worship is the most important thing that we do as Christians. It is the main engine of our Christian discipleship and it is the thing that we will continue to do well past this life and into eternity. Certainly then we will want to do this well. And by well, I mean by principle. And I hope to show you now principles that rise from the whole Bible. Let's pray. Father, we want to worship you well. We, we desire that you should receive worship according to your good pleasure and according to your revelation because we know among everything else that is true of worship it is uh, our greatest good to find ourselves rightly before the Lord our highest desire of course is for you to get glory so speak to us we pray fix our hearts even more firmly on the truth of your word particularly when it comes to our worship of you we pray these things in Jesus name amen Acts chapter 21, I want to pick up at verse 17 and read through 26. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. And as for the Gentiles who have believed, 
We've sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple giving notice when the days of purification will be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. As I was thinking about worship and uh, studying the matter last week, I came in the Lord's kind providence upon an article entitled, Can a Woman Lead Worship? It uh, caught my attention, and so I read on. Uh, Of course, the first problem is that it's the wrong question, isn't it? It's the wrong question to ask. Uh, Certainly, a woman can lead worship. Many already do, and uh, some, I expect, with great skill. So it's the wrong question. The question with which, uh, with that the article was really addressing is this. May a woman lead in worship, be allowed to lead worship, that is. And once properly expressed, that question then begs another question, doesn't it? The question behind whether a woman should be allowed to lead worship is allowed by whom or allowed by what? What is the standard by which we answer such a question? What is the authority? Well, I was unsurprised to read this line just a couple of paragraphs into the article, uh, into the article's answer, quote, Part of the difficulty in answering this question is that the New Testament doesn't contain a worship leader job description. The New Testament does not contain a worship leader job description. Now that is a very telling line. Did you you listen carefully to it? And like the first question, this statement also begs a question, doesn't it? What is the question that it begs? Well, just this. Why the New Testament only? Why the New Testament only? In searching for a worship leader job description, why must we limit our inquiry to the last 27 books to the exclusion of the first 39? And the answer to that question is that when it comes to worship, modern American evangelicals have widely made an assumption. The assumption is that the first 39 books of the Bible are irrelevant to our worship. In other words, there is a modern prejudice against three quarters of our Bibles when it comes to decisions about worship. And that's why we've turned to the text we have before us this morning in Acts 21. It's a shocking text. Shocking, that is, to the sensibilities of modern American evangelicals, anyway, to read about our great Christian hero, the Apostle Paul, worshiping in the temple some 30 years after Jesus' resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven. What is going on here? I hope it's been long enough since our time together in Acts that you won't mind if I remind you that Paul has here returned to Jerusalem from his, what we call, the third missionary journey. With him are some representatives of the largely uh, Gentile churches and, uh, and you remember why they were there. They brought with them a gift from the Gentile churches to the poor of the church in Jerusalem. Paul intended that this act of love should, should strengthen the bond of unity between Jewish and Gentile Christians. Well, the reunion between Paul and the church leaders in Jerusalem was happy, we read, and we're unsurprised by that. And And the Christians in Jerusalem were no doubt delighted to meet their Gentile brothers 
and they were deeply touched by the gift that uh, the generous gift that was brought. You see, the church had been growing all over the place. Jews entering it, Gentiles entering it. And among the Jewish converts were those, many of those who retained with their Christian faith a great zeal for the traditional forms of Jewish piety. Things like Saturday Sabbath or um, circumcision or distinctions between clean and unclean foods. No problem with any of that. But the fly in the ointment was the rumor mongering by, the, by some troublemakers who, who were spreading this falsehood that Paul was, was teaching Jewish Christians in those outlying places to forsake those customs of Jewish piety. He did no such thing. But still it was troubling to hear the rumors that Paul was undermining Jewish Christian loyalty to those established forms of Jewish piety. The church's leaders in Jerusalem, they knew that these rumors were false. It had never been Paul's desire to disabuse the Jewish Christians of their Jewishness. Indeed, on his most recent missionary journey, Paul himself had entered into a Nazarite vow, a very Jewish thing to do. Paul still lived as a Jew in as many ways as possible, even as he made his way among the Gentiles. So the leaders of the Jerusalem church have a proposal. They propose an idea. They knew that there were, at that moment, four men there, right there in Jerusalem, who had happened to be coming to the end of the period of their Nazarite vow. And uh, so they... And you can read about the Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6. Uh, that uh, it meant for them that uh, this was a time for them to offer sacrifices of lambs and, and bread at the temple. So here's our proposal, Paul. You pay the expenses. And by the way, that was no small amount. You pay the expenses for those sacrifices and participate with those men in those sacrificial rituals. These actions on Paul's part would constitute a very uh, public demonstration that Paul, the Christian apostle, was still a practicing Jew. Paul did it, and he did it happily. He happily participated in the temple ritual with these fellow Jewish Christians. In fact, later on in Acts, in Acts chapter 24, we read that he went to the temple. He had come to Jerusalem to present sacrifices in the temple. Now, you may not be surprised uh, to remember that history, but uh, I find it very, very striking here that the Apostle Paul is some 30 years after Pentecost still participating in temple worship. Now, doesn't it seem to us like there must certainly be something wrong with this? What's wrong with that picture? I mean, wasn't the temple supposed to be obsolete? Uh, out of date? Had not Christ replaced all of that with, with His death on the cross? Was it appropriate? We want to say for Paul to be offering sacrifices even after the sacrifice had been given on the cross. Even Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Well, apparently Paul thought it was, as did the other Jewish Christians of the time. There, is, there was nothing anti-evangelical about the temple worship. There was nothing contrary to the gospel. Paul's actions show us that the worship of the temple was actually fully genuinely, authentically Christian worship. It always had been. And what that means for us, dear flock, is that the worship of the Old Testament, as we unwisely call it, and the regulation of it that fills the pages of the first 39 books of our Bibles is not some obsolete, 
out-of-date, irrelevant stuff. Sure, the forms have changed since the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, but the principles remain the same. Moses has much to teach us about worship, the worship of God, and many of the questions that are being asked today can be answered because the principles that rise from all 66 books of our Bible still are applicable, not just the last 27. Indeed, Moses must teach us much about worship because the bulk of what the Bible has to teach us about worship, as a matter of fact, is found in the first 39 books of the Bible, and of those, especially the earliest ones. And matters not repeated in the 27 of the new, and for, if for no other reason, then they just didn't have to be. So thoroughly is the worship of God described in the more ancient scriptures. It just didn't need to be repeated. Now this is true of our, our worship as it is of many aspects of our Christian lives, isn't it? You know, if you want to learn about the nature of God, most of what you learn about God, you learn from the Old Testament. Concerning God's covenant promise to be our God, and the God of our children, his intergenerational covenant. Same thing. The nature of true wisdom, the purpose and function of the sacraments, the nature of the atonement by sacrifice, all these we learn, and in some cases primarily learn, from the first 39 books. Now what is true of all of those things is certainly also true of worship. Now, as I say, it's true, things, some things have changed in their forms. You know, the Sabbath ha has moved following the Lord's resurrection from the seventh day to the first of the week, but uh, still remains, in principle, uh, the same and for the same purpose. The meaning remains the same. Circumcision has been replaced with baptism, but they both mean and indicate the same thing. Just so, the forms of worship uh, have uh, changed, are a bit different now, but the nature and the principles of worship remain the same, exactly the same. Look at worship in the most ancient parts of the Bible, and you will find what? A stress laid on the engagement of the heart in worship. The need for active participation in worship. The singing of hymns the hearing of God's Word, the sharing together of a sacramental meal, public prayer, the benediction at the end, it's all there. In fact, we're unsurprised. We've been reminded from time to time, and recently from the book of Corinthians in our time together, and, uh, and even more recently in our celebration of Pentecost a couple of weeks ago, that the gospel of grace... You know, the covenant of grace has always, always been the same. Same covenant. Moses preached the same gospel as Jesus, who preached the same gospel as Paul. The Spirit has always been with and in His people. The Christian life has always been the same. Salvation has always been the same. Faith and our relationship with God has always been the same since He began calling sinners to Himself at the very and near the very beginning. Abraham, the Bible tells us, is our father. We are the Israel of God. That's what the Bible says calls us fellow Gentiles our fathers the scripture tells us Gentiles came out of Egypt at the exodus the first 39 books of the Bible are our is our Bible just as surely as is the last 27 
there's more continuity in the Bible than discontinuity. And when we take all of those facts to heart, they have immense implications for what we're doing here right now and in worship every Lord's Day. And it explains, I think, helps to explain why our worship is so, well, strange to so many of our contemporary Christian friends. In the time that remains, I want to offer just three examples of the difference it makes for our worship that we apply the unity of the Bible to our decisions about worship. They have to do with liturgy, with leadership, and with lyric. First, because our worship is governed by the whole Bible, we have a distinct liturgy. Now, what do we mean by liturgy? We mean the content and the ordering of that content in a worship service. Every church has a liturgy. Even churches that boast uh, that they are non-liturgical, <laughs> as if that were a good thing, uh, have a liturgy. All churches do. The, the liturgy is simply the order in which things are done. It's the sequence of actions that make up the ritual on the Lord's Day service. And it is be, by means of the liturgy that the entire congregation made up as we are of many individual uh, human beings. Each of us priests can converse with God. It's the way that a congregation of priests can make an offering of itself to God like you do week after week. Now the most common liturgy of the American Evangelical Church today is composed basically of three things. 20 minutes or more of singing songs, or rather listening to songs being sung uh, from the platform, one after another after another, an offering, and a sermon, and maybe also a prayer. There's no discernible uh, significance to the order of these things, and so they can be interchanged at whim. One thing uh, you know will always happen at an evangelical worship service as a fixed principle. There will be, yes, an offering. Thank you. Exactly. But any sense of progression of development or movement through the service is largely foreign to our contemporaries. Why is that? Well, it's because those who are now tasked with constructing and superintending uh, much of modern worship pay no instruction at all to the Old Testament. But only let the church, let a church remember the scrupulous care shown for the order of events in the sacrificial ritual, like we read about, for example, in the book of Leviticus. And it becomes clear how important the order of events in God's worship must be. And just think about it. Think about this. Put your hands on the head of the animal while you're confessing your sin and then kill it. What a powerful statement is being made. That, as a matter of fact, is the message of biblical Christianity. But now turn that order around. Kill the animal and then put your hands on it and you have an entirely different religion. You have paganism. You, you have the, identify, the worshiper identifying himself as the giver of the gift with quid pro quo in mind. You know, that now God owes me or the gods owe me back. But the former order, the animal dying in the place of the sinner, in that picture you have the sacrifice that the Son of God has made for us as He lay down His life to pay the penalty for our sins. 
Or think about this example, the, the vision of God in the temple that Isaiah saw. Remember this in Isaiah 6? Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the angels flying about, covering their faces in his presence before the Lord, crying out, Holy, holy, holy. What does Isaiah do next? Does he say, here am I, send me. No. He knows what to do. He falls on his knees and then on his face before God. He says, woe is me. I am undone for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts and only after confession does the angel of the lord go over and bring a coal from the altar a burning coal with tongs and press it to isaiah's lips a wonderful picture of the forgiveness of his sins only then does the Lord inquire who will go for us. And only after that does Isaiah say, here am I, send me. You see the order. The order of the element. Drop, drop any one of those elements or turn them around and you have profoundly betrayed the gospel. That's what we're doing, Lord's Day after Lord's Day in His house. And in this order, we're repeating the gospel over and over. We're having it reinforced in the depths, woven into the fabric of our hearts and of our minds through the proper elements in the proper order in divine worship, a gospel order. And by the way, make no mistake about this. Your children, the children here in the sanctuary, they're thinking about the gospel and about salvation and about God are being powerfully shaped and molded here week after week too. Even before our little children know what is happening, they are learning with us who are continuing to learn, right, about the Lord, about His grace, about our sin, about our need, about His provision for us. And they with us are being refreshed and renewed in this worship and reinforced in that truth every time we gather of a Lord's Day through a distinct and carefully constructed liturgy. This liturgy we learn from the whole Bible. Second, because our worship is governed by the whole Bible, we have a distinct conviction about leadership, about the leadership of the worship service. Our, our worship is led and uh, superintended by our minister. And our sacraments are administered by our minister and only by our ministers. Now, for all of the church's history, of the Christian church's history, up to a few decades ago, what I just said would not have seemed strange or controversial in the least. But have you noticed the shift that shift on, in American evangelicalism on this point too, and even conservative Presbyterianism. Over the past few decades, pastors have been abdicating their responsibility as the superintendents of worship. I've watched this pattern, and, and you've seen it too. In some cases, at least there seems to apparently have been some some sense of, of, of the importance of this work of leading worship, some vague sense, because at least it was at first largely uh, given off from the ministers to uh, church officers, to elders and to deacons that they gave their responsibilities 
in worship, but, but soon it was worship committees, and then it has become artists and musicians. I guess I should not have been shocked uh, then attending a PCA church a couple of years ago in North Carolina and find my, to find myself being led with the congregation for nearly the entire worship service by the pastor's wife. And she, by the way, dressed in a tank top and um, running shorts to boot. Such is the trend. And therefore, the strangeness of our minister-led congregational worship. It seems intolerably boring for the modern evangelical who is now becoming accustomed to being led in worship by a variety lineup of semi-disheveled teenagers and 20-somethings bouncing on the balls of their feet, waving their arms wildly, yelling into microphones with forced expressions on their faces, alternating between pain and ecstasy. Still, there apparently remains, even in our evangelicalism, some instinctive sense that the leaders of worship must have some particular qualifications for their work as witnessed by the current raging debate over whether they should be called worship leaders or worship pastors. However, did we get to this point? Well, quite simply, we ignored the larger part of our Bibles. We've ignored the first 39 books in which the Lord teaches us, and plainly so, that he sets apart certain men as ministers having assigned exclusively to their office the responsibility to plan, to prepare, and to lead God's people in worship. They were called priests in the Old Testament, but they were simply what our ministers are supposed to be today, leaders in word and sacrament. That elusive job title, uh, job description rather, of worship leaders that the article I referenced earlier seeks is found in Deuteronomy 33, verse 10. They shall teach Jacob your rules and Israel your law, they shall put incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. And some lead the worship. The worship of God. And the same work then is devolved on the first ministers in the new epoch who were the apostles who urged that an office of deacon be established so that they could give themselves to the prayer and the ministry of the word, which expression we saw last week has to do, references the worship of God's people on the Lord's day. Why many of our ministers are now insisting on passing off this responsibility to others, from officers to artists to their wives, is a study all its own. But I suspect that the reasons range from ease to the egalitarian spirit of our age that is embarrassed by or even intolerant of any sort of clergy laity distinction. Much more could be said, but I promised a third example. Liturgy, leadership, and lyric. Third, because our worship is governed by the whole Bible, we have a distinct conviction about the lyric of our worship service. Insofar as our worship is sung, we insist that it rise to the standard of the Psalter. 
the book of Psalms and the, the inspired book of songs in the Bible. So if we're not singing psalms specifically, then we are singing hymns that rise to the standard that is set in God's songbook. And for that reason, we sing only hymns that, like the psalms, are full of theological truth and sophistication, devotional depth, complex thought, and beauty. These are the standards that God's Word has set. The, the whole of God's Word, the whole Bible for His worship. Not just the New Testament, though certainly including the New Testament. So for example, given the choice between singing one simple idea, even a biblical idea, over and over again, like this is the day the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it, we do sing those words, but then we go on to sing the next, uh, deeper and more complex thoughts from Psalm, where am I? Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the chief stone of the corner. And then we go on to sing other stanzas. I shall not die but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord and of the fact that the Lord has disciplined me severely, but He's not given me over to death. Singing only thoughtful hymns that ride, that measure up to the standard of God's songbook in depth and beauty and glory and devotion. This, by the way, counter to what might be imagined, I suppose, at this point, uh, this does not mean that everything that we, have to, that we sing has to be old. You know, thank the Lord for the likes of the Gettys who have recently given us O Church Arise and In Christ Alone, hymns truly worthy of the worship of God. But old or new, our lyric, being governed by the entire Bible, must rise to the standard of the entire Bible. Singing lyrics like those as we are led by our minister in careful liturgical order may admittedly make us sound and look as a church among churches kind of weird. Maybe even render us less attractive to the so-called seekers. But so be it. It is before our master that we must rise or fall especially in worship. Amen.